Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to uh, Work Reduce Live. Uh, I'm Brian Dolan. I'm the CEO and founder of Work Reduce. And this is the, I think, fourth in our series of uh, panels about the advertising industry. Work Reduce is a staffing and services business for the media industry, and we like to get together some of the most exciting and interesting people that we can find to talk about uh, things that are relevant to, uh, to the industry um, and uh, you know, answer your questions. So today, we've got an outstanding panel of advertising journalists, uh, some of whom I've talked to in a professional capacity, all of whom I have been reading for a long time. So like, I'm really thrilled to have everybody here and uh, see what kind of questions we have them uh, have for them. I'll introduce everyone in just a second, but just in terms of rules of the road, uh, we have a Q&A and chat open during this. So we'll be able to answer your questions um, and uh, I'll be manning the, the chat and Q&A uh, while Sarah Fay moderates. Um, and uh, feel free to submit uh, at any point and we'll try to batch the questions up so we're not uh, interrupting everybody. So without further ado, um, let me introduce our panel. So going around in the grid that I see here, I've got uh, in my upper left, uh, Patrick Coffey. So Patrick is a business insider correspondent covering advertising and media, uh, previously editor at large at Adweek. Um, and uh, all around, you know, generally knowledgeable guy about the industry. We've got uh, uh, Laura, Laura O'Reilly, who is the senior correspondent uh, at Digiday, formerly of Yahoo, Wall Street Journal, and Business Insider. Uh, and Allison Weisbrot, who is the senior editor at Ad Exchanger, covering agencies, future of TV, uh, and other topics. Moderating today, uh, we are pleased to be joined by Sarah Fay, who is the uh, managing director of Glasswing Ventures. It's a venture capital firm investing in technology, both in and out of the media space. Uh, and Sarah is the former CEO of Dentsu Aegis Network and uh, of Kara. Were you a founder at Kara, Sarah? I was a founder or a partner at an agency that was acquired by Kara. And then gotcha. I stayed on to uh, start their first digital services offering. So Sarah is both knowledgeable about the ad industry as a former executive um, and as a VC, really um, deeply experienced in rooting out bullshit. So that is a, I think, great qualification for talking to this crew of people who are forced to do that 24 seven. I would say this is a, um, well, I don't know, maybe I'm being unfair. This is a bullshit heavy industry. There's a lot of people who, if you ask me, have no idea what they're talking about and it doesn't let them stop themselves um, from saying it. And it's the job of these folks to figure out what the hell is going on. So uh, before I turn it over, Sarah, to you, uh, I'll just give another little plug for Work Reduce. You know, if you are working in the media um, advertising industry, and uh, we would love to help you, you know, with our team of distributed experts who uh, we provide service desk and staff augmentation models for uh, making your business go faster in the advertising world. I'll, I'll leave it at that. You can check it out on our website, workreduce.com. And without further ado, uh, over to you to lead this panel, Sarah. All right. Um, thank you, Brian, for having me as moderator, and thanks to the people joining. And um, I'm really excited to interview these panelists. Um, as you can imagine, as a former agency exec, you spend a lot of time trying to get inside the minds of the people covering the industry, and um, also to you know tell them stories and have those stories translated. To, to print. So I think a lot of people will just kind of be interested to see how you guys are thinking about doing your jobs. Um, it's probably cliche to say that we're living in unprecedented times, but just to review in the past three months, a pandemic brought, brought the global economy to a screeching halt. Racial tensions hit a tipping point with the murder of George Floyd and others bringing about the loudest and most urgent calls for change that our country has seen since the civil rights movement. And that certainly hit 
the agency space. Unemployment went from the lowest we've seen in decades to almost 20% and then down to 13% in a few months. The stock market has been a roller coaster of record breaking losses and gains and then more losses and more recovery. We're still, still dealing with COVID-19 and the debate of reopening, and the market you guys cover has been tossed in the sea of one massive wave after another, causing revenue losses, layoffs, and hits to valuation. And you guys have been there to cover it all. In a way, it's never been a better time to be a reporter and to be able to make an impact on your readership. So I'd like to start out the panel asking the three of you um, what you hope the outcome of some of your reporting will be. Do you have any piece of reporting recently that you really hope people will take to heart? And um, you know, now, now is a special time when your message uh, can really make an impact. So I'll start with Patrick. Um. Well, I mean, it, you know, as a reporter, it's not, you know, you don't think of yourself as, uh, as an activist, right? You don't think that, that it's your role to, to um, bring about this or that outcome. But uh, at the same time, ideally, you, you want to let uh, the public know about certain things that that maybe would not they would not know about otherwise i mean that's the 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 real I, speaking for myself at least the stories that have the most value are the ones that that are uh that the companies that i cover would would probably be less likely to be pushing out um so i guess what i would would want my reporting to accomplish would would really be to offer more of a uh uh you know, <clears throat> sort of an inside uh, look, so to speak, cliche as that is, at, at these companies, at the agencies and the holding companies and um, the clients as well, and um, how they're uh, dealing with these various crises um, to the degree that I can, um, rather than the way that they would like for you to see them dealing with it. Not that the two are necessarily mutually exclusive, but uh, I think that it's, um, you know, I don't work for them, so. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Is it, that's a little general, but um, just things like, uh, you know, whenever you can get internal communications from a company that uh, they didn't necessarily intentionally release, that's often revealing. Um, it's uh, things like the way that the major holding companies have chosen to respond to the pandemic, uh, the way that they've chosen to respond to the push for diversity in the wake of the uh, Black Lives Matter protests and uh, the death of George Floyd, things like that, and the way that their clients have done the same, and that it's been the way that it's uh, been a little different this time really feels like it's been a little different this time than it has been in the recent past. So is that, do we generally think that this time there's going to be an impact? And one of, one of my other, other questions to you is about diversity in the agency and marketing space, which I think we can all agree isn't where it needs to be. Um, and there, I think there is a call to arms and people are responding in a louder way, what do you guys think needs to happen? And you know, in order for there to be true change in the industry. Um, well, I mean, this is sort of an answer to both of your uh, both of your questions. But um, I wrote a story recently about how marketers and their agencies can better actually you know, act on, on diversity rather than just create talking points and sort of, you know, put out a tweet that says that they support Black Lives Matter and whatever else is going on in the country. So I think that um, it really starts, you know, by looking internally and making sure that the company that you work for reflects the people that you're selling to and you're marketing to um, all the way up to the C-suite. 
And I think, you know, once you really can't uh, make any change unless you start there and start looking inwards. Yeah. How about you, Laura? Are you, are you seeing anything? Well, actually, you, you sit in London, but mm -hmm. I guess you're following what's going on over here as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, that, you know, that particular story, um, you know, the, the killing of George Floyd sparked a, a global conversation. We saw there were, you know, protests happening um, all across the world, but also um, the actions that companies are taking. It's a, it's a multinational, not just a, a US thing. This is about, you know, systemic institutional racism and, and um, injustice. Um, so, I mean, yeah, just to build on some of the points that, um, that, that have already been said. I, I think often um, people confuse advertising journalists as being part of the industry and that we should be, um, I, I've had this no matter where I worked, whether it was at the Wall Street Journal or whether it was at um, like a trade publication like Digi Day or Marketing Week where often people in the industry try to chastise me and my colleagues for not writing about all the positive things that are happening. Um, and there are loads of positive things that are happening and that's great. And that's for their company earnings calls and their blog posts. Um, and our, our job is to, um, as, as Patrick was saying, it's, it's to find the stuff that the, the companies don't want you to be writing about missteps. Um, and, and particularly in, in, in this particular area around, around kind of, um, diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, these, these are the stories that people don't, that, that companies don't want to be caught out on, but um, ultimately are, are stories that need to be told because often people um, don't have a voice within the company to be able to tell them. Um, so yeah, I think there's, yeah, there's, 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 there's one thing just about the way we are um, here to report on the industry, not to serve as the kind of cheerleaders um, of it. And, and also, yeah, to, to, um, to everybody's point, just about, again, we're, we're not really there to give advice, but we're there to pick out stories and trends that, um, you know, you might not be getting from your CEO or you might not be getting from, um, let's say, the, the company Twitter account and the company blog right. and, and pulling together those things. So there's, um, there's no shortage yeah. of cheerleaders uh, for this stuff out there. That's for sure. Definitely. Right. And it's a long-standing problem and there's definitely, there's a lot of excuses, um, pipeline being one of them, but there's certainly things that you can do to address the pipeline as well. Um, and I'm sure that you guys are, are calling out uh, the companies on those things and hopefully holding them accountable. And I guess, you know, Patrick, um, absolutely, your job is to report the facts and not necessarily to have an opinion, but as journalists, you can also hold companies accountable for their for their actions. Um, and I also think I also think you know to to Laura's point about like it's not our job to you know sort of tell them what to do, just sort of like expose and and report the facts. I think we can also just like highlight diverse voices and just sort of like people who have that advice to give to help companies be better. Make sure those those voices are being amplified. I mean, you can, yeah, I mean, that, that's such a value. It, you, can, you can just look at me and see how problematic it is for me to report on something like, you know, diversity and inclusion and, and equity in the ad industry, right? So the key really is just for, if I am going to be writing about that, is for me to talk to people who are not like myself and uh, to relate their experiences um, you know, within the reporting that I do because it's not about my opinion, you know, it's not about like um, what I may or may not think about what this company should do or yeah. Yeah. It's what these people have experienced and how they explain it to me. Yeah, to, to dovetail sort of the, the tone you take and, and the way you report, you know, obviously there's, there's a ton of news, so there's a lot to just keep up with what's happening. But if everybody's reporting on the same news, your story can get lost. So what do you guys do to um, make a story different? Like what are, what are the elements that you'll go after? What will you dig for uh, to try and have an angle that's different from the, the rest of the, the reporting landscape? I think first and foremost, it's about 
talking to your own sources and doing your own interviews and not just sort of like copying and, and like, you know, rewriting what somebody, somebody else is reporting. Cause I think, you know, a lot of the times we are working at trade publications, we're writing about the same stuff, but I think, you know, talking to your people about it and getting, teasing out an angle that, you know, would work for your particular readers. Cause we all have like the same readers, but like looking for slightly different things. So I think that's, that's, the key thing is to just talk to people on your own. Yeah, and is it the same for you? You, the other two as well? Yeah, I, oh, sorry, you go ahead, Patrick. I can only speak for, for my publication, but the way that we generally address it is that we, uh, you know, we're only gonna cover something if, it, if, it's, uh, if, if it's not like, a, if it's like an embargoed release, you know, if it's a study that's gonna go out to, five different publications that are all going to run it at 10 a.m. on Monday morning, then we're just not going to cover it because the, the value of is, is going to be relatively low to our readership because they can read it here and there and elsewhere. And you may have like a 15 minute phone call with the person who directed the study or whatever, but how, you know, how much is that really going to add? Um, yeah. And there's a question of, of what it's like, and I feel for, certain people there's a pressure to cover all of that stuff right and there's a pressure to oh you know you want to have an interesting line you want to draw out whatever you can from the person who was involved in this research which may very well be very interesting on its own but it's it's difficult to do that and it, it kind of sort of stands as a press release frankly so which is not to demean the work that that the reporters who cover that are doing by any means but that's just the way that that we approach it and part of that is because, because of our business model, because we're very much like, we're bifurcated. We're, we're all about, my job is to drive subscriptions. And then we have another side of the business that's all about traffic and ad revenue. So, but that's just uh, speaking for myself. So, so how should somebody pitch you if they want you to cover their piece of research or they want you to cover their company? Like what, what would break through for you um, if, you know, because I know you hear from, you know, t lots of people every day uh, who feel they have a special story for you. What, what, what grabs you? Well, I think one thing to keep in mind is there's probably like six times more PR people than there are advertising journalists. So just like taking the time to know what we cover and not only what the publication that we write for covers and focuses on, but like that specific reporter, I think is helpful and, and important. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to echo what Patrick was saying earlier as well, I mean, we have a, um, you know, we've, we've moved to a membership strategy, which means that everything that we write needs to be worth somebody paying for, that they can't find somebody somewhere else. So we might be writing about the same topics, um, but, there will be a particular angle or we'll go deeper on this one very nerdy element or something like that. So, you know, just similarly, so, so to your point about um, pitching, you know, I don't think any of us are going to write up the, the blanket press release that went out to everybody. Um, and it's really kind of boring and frustrating to have to explain that <laughs> like very often. Um, it, it should be kind of obvious. Um, and also our, like, it's so rare that a story comes from a PR pitch, frankly, like it's, it's super rare. Um, at least in the stuff that, that, um, I do, and I'm sure stuff that Patrick and Alison do as well. Um, the, the best thing is getting, is pitching the relationship as opposed to pitching the specific news line and the specific story. Um, you know, it's about just opening up what that company's, um, expertise is um opening up who they you know who the who the main players are um and again and, and just a really important thing is just putting forward a diverse set of voices because um just lord knows particularly in like certain sections of, of the advertising industry the same old people are, are the same old people that are quoted and the people that are always put forward for industry events and things like that so just being kind of just being knowledgeable of, of, of all of those things um, is a far better pitch than going, here's this release that's going out on Wednesday at 10 a.m. and we've pitched it to everybody and their dog. Right, and you guys, do you spend a lot of time getting to know the people in the industry? So when you're 
when you're writing a story, it's, you know, you're not starting from scratch, understanding their angle, um, or who they are, what they stand for. Yeah, I think a lot of it is about relationships. And like some of my best sources are people who have taken the time to talk to me about what they do, you know, we'll, we'll grab a coffee and I'll just, they'll, they'll take time out of their day to just talk to me and answer my questions. So, um, you know, rather than, especially if it's a company that I've never heard of before, rather than like pitching me like some specific story, maybe just reach out and say, Hey, like, do you have time to talk to this company get to know them, see if they're a fit that tends to work a lot better than like putting the expectation out there for a story right away. Yeah. Yeah, and just be really responsive as a source. So um, let's let's talk about the agencies a little bit. That's that's my old world going back to. I mean, I left it in two thousand nine, so I'm happily removed for more than a decade. Um, but they're going through a tough time right now, right? Um, and we've seen it before. Uh, you know, there have been other downturns and you know, it just is a fact of life. The agencies have to downsize. There's no, you know, choice that they have. These are public companies. Um, and then in the past downturns, they have downsized and then they've rebuilt, maybe even stronger than before. But they ultimately went back to doing business in the same way that they did before, by and large. Do you think that's going to happen this time? Do you think that this is a catalyst for bigger change in the way agencies service their clients? Um, and are they going to come back in the same way? Just curious to know as, as pundits, what you guys think about the industry you cover. Well, um, everyone that I've spoken to is, is very skeptical uh, as to, I mean, if you look at the estimates at the number of jobs that were cut, including layoffs and furloughs. And by the way, this is the first time in covering the industry that I've even really heard the word furlough applied as to the moves that ad agencies are making in the US. Uh, I mean, it, but the total goes into the tens of thousands and you have to think, okay, well, you know, when are their clients going to start spending this money again? And when are they going to start, more importantly, when are they going to spend it the way that they used to? It's very hard to think that they're just going to ramp back up and that they're much less that they're going to be spending it on broadcast TV. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, where are the jobs going to be for these people? Uh, so it's like, especially the, the companies that have to respond to shareholders, it's very hard to imagine that they're going to be back up to full staffing um, within even uh, a few years. Uh, okay. Maybe, maybe independent agencies. Maybe the you know maybe your Wyden and Kennedys or your you know someone like that. Uh, that's they're they're an anomaly though, right? There, I mean, they, they don't quite treat their business in the same way, um, and their clients are getting hit too. So. I don't think it's going to be good for anyone, but um, it's going to be especially rough for the the um, creative agencies that that are owned by publicly traded companies uh, and the media side too, right? It's just and the media agencies were already in a bad place because their their services are so commoditized, and I just don't see it. I don't see how there's going to be this this V-shaped recovery or whatever Martin Sorrell calls it. Um, it's, I, it's not looking great. Yeah, I don't think, um, I also think it's kind of an opportunity for them. I mean, it sucks for people, like people are gonna be out of jobs and that's terrible. But I think for agencies, like I don't think they necessarily need as much staff as they have. I think it's a legacy structure with a lot of sort of, you know, middle management and things like that. And I think that they could lean a lot heavier into automation and eliminate a ton of, you know, back office roles that could easily be done um, by a machine. And this is kind of what's happening across industries to the entire workforce. So it's going to be tough for, for employees, but I think, you know, agencies should take an opportunity to embrace the automation that's sort of just been like pushing into their business for the past decade or more. Yep. 
I think so too. I mean, I, you know, um, automation in some cases is a disincentive for agencies which are, um, they have time-based fees, right? Uh, and there have been a number of trends that, you know, I was originally skeptical about in-housing, um, but, you know, that seems to be continuing and not going backwards. So um, very, very possibly marketers will, will take on more. Um, you know, media technology or marketing technology is an area you guys cover too. And it's, that's the area where I'm kind of now interested as an investor. Um, give the industry a grade. When you think about, you know, because it's really hard. I also know as an agency, it's really hard to review all this stuff and it's hard to innovate as it is but you certainly can't innovate with all the thousands of companies that have innovative technology. But how are the agencies handling innovation? Do you feel like the industry at large is pushing forward? Has it been too much of a herd mentality into, you know, Amazon, Google, Facebook? Um, do you think that that's part of the problem? I, th I think they all kind of talk a good game um, and our job is to try and decipher what's real and what's not. Obviously not being a customer of these services, um, it can often be, you know, it, you're having just to, to take on a lot of volume as, as to what, you know, what, what people are saying as to how advanced they are in, in these areas. Um, and it's even hard to interpret the, um, even the earnings calls, like what they say is data and digital is maybe not and is kind of conflated with, with other things. Um, so this is a cop out, but I, like the grade is, is at different scales depending on different agencies and even down to agency teams and how they work with clients because ultimately it's down to how, how much kind of wiggle room the, the client will give them to um, invest in a big project that takes you know, 12 months to implement before you actually start seeing results um, and all those kinds of things. So often it's about actually just doing things cheaper and quicker and, and white labeling um, and then trying to sell that as this big um, unique proposition that only X agency can do. Um, whereas actually it was just the PowerPoint that was the unique thing. Um, so I don't know, my, my grade, I guess I'll give them like, a, I don't know, a C. There's room for improvement, but I think a lot of it is kind of bluster um and without and maybe Alison because you're closer but I don't know but I don't it's it's really hard to tell who's actually winning and who's yeah. not from from our viewpoint I would agree with your point about like it really is up to the client I think agencies want a lot of times to embrace these things but they're kind of hamstrung because they don't get paid for like building technology or you know white labeling something or embracing technology um so it's it's up to the client at the end of the day, how much they want to do. And I would agree that like every time an agency launches a tech platform or some kind of data platform, I'm always skeptical because it's generally white labeled or it's generally, you know, it doesn't work or they just started pitching it, but no one's really using it. So it's, it's, I kind of look at those things as like a PR stunt almost, but I do think that you know, they're trying because they have to, they have to embrace technology or else they're not going to be in business. So, and I would be curious to hear what Patrick thinks about the creative side. Cause I think they haven't leaned in as much, um, but I don't, I don't cover that business as much. Yeah. You, you guys are both closer to the tech side than I am. And, and I'm always uh, asking people to, I feel like I'm just drowning in, in um, jargon whenever agencies try to explain to me what they're doing. And I honestly, I'm skeptical of all of it. Um, but it's on, on especially on the, as, as it apl supposedly applies to the creative side. I mean, it's one thing to talk about, you know, media buying and applying tech tools to that. But um, even there, it's, it's just frankly impossible for me to tell. I feel like it, you, you kind of need to be you need to specialize in that area to really understand it. And then just like, like Lara said a couple of minutes ago, if, if you're not a customer, like if you don't actually you know, 
work in this area, it's, it's even harder to, to truly appreciate the, the products that they're dealing with and to separate the, the, the bullshit from the reality. Yeah. How many AI powered dynamic creative platforms are lying on the scrap heap of history at this point? I mean, I, I keep hearing about new ones coming out too. And it's like, man, didn't somebody try that already? And Sarah, I'm sorry, you, you are on the board of no, Seltra. No, it's, so. it's a great, no, no, no. <laughs> Seltra is, is creative automation, which is different from DCO and they're doing great. Um, but automation, but DCO, there are a thing. lot of um, technologies to apply to the automation of content and creative, but I think that there's just as much there is um, muscle memory in the industry or, you know, just conflicting interests with the services being provided that are resistant to that. Um, so, you know, I, I do think lots of times it comes down to the marketers and where they might see value to really pull in the agencies to say, hey, let's try this. And I think that's where a lot of the selling happens these days too. And, and just I some comment, comments coming in from the peanut gallery, uh, Augustine Fu saying that uh, agencies have no time, manpower or expertise to innovate, just selling the next shiny object that comes along. And uh, to that point, whatever happened to blockchain in advertising? <laughs> 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 well, um, Never happening. yeah, I think blockchain is at work in the background sometimes. Um, I feel like blockchain is just so new in general. It's like not even really ready for, for average. Everyone got really excited about it, but <laughs> I think there's still things to work out there. A hammer um, looking for a nail in some, some, some cases, right? And, and data strategies are becoming so important. And I think, um, Lara, you're right, the agencies talk a mean game, but there are various levels of expertise when it comes to applying data. And sometimes they're just not even, um, they, they can't get access to the client's data to even be the ones in control of, you know, how, how things get measured across uh, all of the various activities. So it's, it's hard. Um, so let's talk about like the whole fact of uh, Facebook, Google, and Amazon taking up all the air in the room. Um, and I mean, it just continues to go in this direction. I think Amazon is the new big player in that space. Um, actually, there's, I mean, there's a lot of value there. You know, they're very close to where the purchasing happens, but, you know, it does not seem to be going backwards that these giants are taking all of the um, you know, the, the market share. What do you think? I mean, do you think companies are overspent in these places? Um, and is it, is the pendulum going to swing at some point? Or do you think it's just going to, this is, this is how it is now? Well, I think actually, um, unfortunately, yes, I think there's marketers are overspent in these places, but I think unfortunately they're going to continue to spend more in these places because third party cookies are going away. And these platforms are really the only places that have relationships directly with the consumer and first party data that they can use for audience targeting. So I think it's going to become even harder to find your consumer off of these platforms in the future, which is unfortunate because obviously you don't want all the money going to three gigantic tech companies. So do you, you don't think that um, there will be data strategies to compensate for the third party cookies? Because already, you know, Safari, you, you, you can't use third, third party cookies in Safari. I, I don't know, my, my sense in talking to some people is that data will just start to be tied to other things. Yeah, there's definitely strategies to compensate for it. Like, you know, a lot of the agencies and clients talking out about building their first party data sets and using that for targeting. But I think it's going to be a long road to get <laughs> to the point, the, the things that you can do on the platforms. And regardless of having customer data, like, like you just said, Amazon, you know, you can close the loop on a purchase. Like there's certain... These are such powerful um, tech companies with so much attention and so much data that it's really hard to recreate that. Yeah, it's probably probably true. A lot of media planners might like to work in one of these places eventually too. <laughs> but I don't know. You guys might have different. You guys might have different opinions than me. So. <laughs> 
so um, curious to let let's switch um, switch tactics or switch questioning and talk about sort of the personalities of the industry that you cover. It is it is a very personality driven marketplace. Um, are there certain behaviors or people that you cover that you know? If if they're speaking or you have an opportunity to talk to them, you just have to take it because, um, you know, or do, do you have kind of like your favorites to cover or, you know, on the flip side of that, are there things that these people should never do when they're working with you? I don't want to give away my sources to these two. I don't want them to know who I'm speaking to. Uh, I like it when I get trolled on by ad tech troll on Twitter. That's that's usually quite amusing. So I've usually done you know something wrong in their eyes, like not committed libel. Um, but I don't know. There's no. I don't think any single one person is that important. Um, that I'm sure lots of people think they are, and they think they're like the mavens of the industry. But um, Maybe that's where a lot of the reporting went wrong over the years is they just relied on those people to spout off um, ad nauseum. And, you know, we should be speaking to lots of different, <laughs> you know, lots of different types of people um, and make sure that we're not always falling back on those same personalities that make themselves available. Um, Much Martin Sorrell in there, maybe? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. I wouldn't like to say. Um, what do you think, Patrick? <laughs> you don't have to name names. <laughs> I think uh, if you've just published a book, I'm not going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> because you can just hear them talk about it. I, I like a straight shooter, you know, someone who doesn't give me the, the flowery language and euphemisms. Just like, even if you want to talk off the record, just speak English to me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's the real value is it, I mean, and I think that we've, we've, we've all said this previously, but it's like relationship is a cliche word, but it's like, I would love to, to get to know more mid-level people at media buying agencies, you mm -hmm. know, who, who will just speak to me openly about, on background, about what their clients are doing, what their agencies are doing. Um, obviously, then the question arises of, you know, what's in it for them and uh, <laughs> how much uh, professional risk they're taking by, by speaking with me. And, um, you know, it's not sort of a uh, you scratch my back, et cetera, type of thing. But um, that's much more valuable to me than, than uh, any sort of uh, survey or white paper, frankly. You heard it here, folks. You heard it here first, folks. If you're like a mid-level <laughs> agency person, hit up Patrick. Get to know him. It's not, Probably not a bad friend to have, right? <laughs> you, could, you could do a lot worse. You could do a lot worse. So we have um, uh, a couple uh, questions popping up in the Q&A. Let me start with one from Jonathan Gardner. Uh, following up, Sarah, on your question about kind of technology and how the industry is doing. So, uh, what are you hoping the industry manages to do from a tech perspective? And what are you actually excited about? Um, maybe, uh, Laura, you start. Oh, um, hmm. I think um, the, the thing I would be most excited about is if everything was a lot easier to understand. So like the, the principles of programmatic, for example, the actual principle of it is quite easy to understand, but the way in which it gets convoluted or the way in which like every single no name company apparently has this ID graph of millions of users and I have like no idea who they are. So I think just people that can make things simple um, and it's not just in how they communicate. It's obviously just in how they do business as well. That, that would be useful from my perspective. I mean, that's why Facebook is so, you know, that's why it's so big and why it works because it's anyone with a credit card can use it and you can see the results instantly. Um, so yeah, just apply that to everything else. That would be good. Patrick Allison. Um, I 
would like the industry to figure out a way to be less creepy and respect people's privacy more. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, obviously there are benefits to knowing your customers and serving people relevant ads, but I don't think people, you know, there's legislation out now about this. And I think consumers are more aware of how their data is being used online. And I think that the industry needs to respect that. And, um, yeah, just figure out a way to talk to consumers in a way that is impactful and, and doesn't, and not annoying and doesn't violate their privacy. Um, and the other thing I would bring up is just like this conversation going on about diversity and inclusion is really exciting. Um, I feel like there's more momentum than there has been. And even this week, we're seeing, you know, advertisers boycott Facebook, although we'll see if that goes longer than one month. Um, but I think just, yeah, using your collective power as brands with all this money to just, you know, fight for what's right and make an impact, I think is exciting. Not fun, fake news. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that. Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I, I re repeat what, what, what Laura and Allison said, really. I mean, I, I don't really understand why the industry struggles so much to explain the way that it works in terms of especially in terms of data targeting and things like that. I mean, it, and it's, it's inability to do that makes it seem more sinister. You know, I think people tend to read just like politics when people don't understand, they tend to read um, bad totally. into it. Um, so I think it's in the, in the industry's interest to be more transparent, uh, even as they say that they're constantly trying to do that. Yeah, I mean, just to editorialize, it's like, you know, where where is the harm that's coming out of ad targeting? Like, I, that's one thing that hasn't been demonstrated. It, it just, it feels so creepy. And yet, you know, the worst case scenario is generally you give away the Christmas present ideas when your, you know, rest of your household gets retargeted at the IP level, you know, like, so can, can, compared to other damages, right, that are out there that people are dealing with, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and all that kind of stuff, it seems a I mean, little bit trivial sometimes. On that topic of data, and it'd be interested to dig into that a little bit with you guys too, um, just, to, you know, to understand if you, if you think there are companies out there that are best practice. Um, but on, on the, the topic of data, do you think that end users are starting to become more aware of their data and is the issue not that their data is being used but it's being used without their permission or without their knowledge like i think i think a lot of people would be more than happy to use their data if they were getting something for it i think a lot of times it depends on the experience like a lot of people don't really care that facebook and google use their data because they just make their life easier um, but I don't think, you know, getting retargeted nine times for like a pair of shoes is making anyone's life easier. So I think just like, if it's going to make it a simpler experience, that's probably when consumers start to care less. Yeah. Cool. Any, are there other questions uh, coming in, Brian? Yeah, we've got a couple from our, our friend, John Durham here. Uh, for, first one is, um, it appears to me that our trade reporters, this, this illustrious group right here, will ask the follow-up hard questions, right? But in your opinion, why is there a reluctance for political reporters to do the same thing, to ask those hard questions that you guys, I think are, are I mean, I've been asked when I've been interviewed by you guys, and I think other people are as well. So what, what's the difference between you guys in the trade press and, 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 the, and the political folks? Oh. That's an interesting question. <laughs> well, I'm not a political reporter, so I don't know, but um, I think a lot of times in the trade press, we're a lot more like in the weeds on a specific industry and what's going on. So maybe we yeah. have just like deeper knowledge to ask those questions. Um, and I also like, I, if there's like BS in advertising, I can't even imagine politics. So it's probably hard to get a straight answer. Yeah. Laura, any thoughts from the UK? I think your political press is a little bit different than ours. Yeah, I, I, I kind of disagree with the sentiment of the question, but maybe that's to do with, um, I mean, is this political reporters in like a press briefing 
situation or part of the pool and maybe that's kind of different where it's um there are very specific rules around you know how you conduct yourself and access and all that kind of stuff um because i wouldn't say on the whole that political reporters didn't ask the hard follow-up questions i mean there's been some amazing <laughs> political reporting both in the us and in the uk over the past few years and that yeah that doesn't come out by being reluctant to to ask questions Oh, I've you? seen some tough ones on the on the UK press in particular, not not being afraid to ask. And, and then a, another one from from John is uh, more back on the industry topic is, you know, what are you guys tired of hearing about? Like, what what are some topics that should absolutely be buried? And you can't say blockchain. <laughs> John, you're stumping these guys. <laughs> One thing yeah. I'd say is I'd hate, there's a sentence that people use all the time in marketing and advertising, which is pace of change and how quickly everything changes. And, and you know, there's been more change in the last five years than there's been in the last 20, change, change, change. Like that's just so dull and means nothing. And it's just a completely empty statement. So if we can ban like that particular sentence, that would be useful. It's not really a topic. It's just a thing that people say all the time and it just grinds my gears. Do you ever do you ever feel sorry for them <laughs> or some level of empathy i mean you know i guess as you said laura you're really not in the industry or you haven't done that job um it, it i i i think i think sometimes how simple their the world used to be in marketing and advertising where they just start the full service agencies charged 15 percent for developing a holistic campaign, which was basically a TV, <laughs> maybe print. Uh, and now it's just, you know, thousands of, you know, things that they have to consider and technologies. And, um, you know, now it's podcasting and audio, which I know, um, is it you, Lara, that is uh, focused on that? Um, category it might be Allison. I was I read about that a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so this is just like continuously having to master new categories of things that are that are coming up. I just because I'm out I'm out of the industry. I I think oh my god. I'm glad I'm not dealing with that. Exhausting. There's <laughs> so much to keep up with. Yeah. Now I deal with it as an investor. So you, you still have to understand, you know, what's going to move the needle. Um, and they have to think about that too. Patrick, you you were going to interject there. Well, kind of things that people are tired of hearing about, just to get back to another topic we just discussed, uh, people talking about, you know, boycotting Facebook or, you know, stop what's you know, without proposing an alternative without without explaining how that's going to work um i don't know that just seems yeah. what happened when everybody boycotted youtube they went back <laughs> right, exactly. i mean i just i don't it doesn't seem workable to me yeah uh how about data is the new oil you guys still hearing that? I was going to say, I'm a little tired of hearing about everybody's data platforms and identity graphs and yeah. like, okay. About how, about how one, one agency or holding company's data solution is better than another. Right. Another thing that's not or Just basic things like, you know, streaming TV is growing. Like, okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Yes. Yes, it is. We're all watching streaming TV now. News at 11. <laughs> so it's, it's also interesting, you know, dipping back into the, I mean, I've never actually left the industry. I've been an, a, an investor in it now for a while, but, um, you know, I remember the days when digital got 5% of the budget, if you were lucky, and now we're actually looking at, you know, TV dropping back. It's sort of the other shoe falling 20 years later um but is that i mean what 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 do you think is sort of the next big revolution of things to happen or what if if you're thinking 10 years hence what's it going to be like mm. you think everything becomes automated 
not everything, but I think a lot, a lot more will be. I think you still need human brain power for, you know, the big idea and things like that. <laughs> not to be a cliche myself. Yeah. I need to go watch Minority Report again since it was so accurate the first time. <laughs> I think there's definitely going to be a lot, like I would watch the gaming space and yeah. like, you know, things like that, like more immersive experiences that brands are going to have to figure out how to show up in naturally. Yeah. And what do you think about the whole work from home experience um, post COVID-19? Do you think that that is we're, we're going to see a complete shift in workforce behavior? I think we'll definitely see the stigma of it going away um, and more flexibility. I think like people will still go into offices, uh, but there won't be that, you know, stigma of like, oh, you're working from home, you're not doing anything. I think everyone's proven that they're productive during this time and that flexibility kind of helps. Yeah. If you look at what WPP has, has done with their new space, this was pre-COVID, um, I, th I think, you know, they have a situation that they, it act, the building actually seats fewer people than work there. Uh, and nobody has an actual desk or office. You just come into work and you find, find the place you're going to work in that day. I think that, that kind of thing might become more prevalent. They yeah. totally claim their own desks, though. I've been in there. Okay. That, that's the thing. They, they People set stake it out, work. you know. Yeah, I've never <laughs> believed in that. I mean, and I'll, I'll just say we see a lot of, you know, obviously from what we're doing of, of the work from home um, versus office stuff. And I've talked to a lot of CEOs recently and none of them across the board in a range of industries are saying that they plan to require anyone in the office in the next 12 months, right? So I think it's it's clearly an option that is uh, out there uh, and will remain so. Yeah, I, my follow-up on that is, I've noticed this a little bit, has everyone being at home changed access for you guys as reporters uh, in terms of who you can get to? Um, in, in some sense it has, like we started a new podcast about you know just dealing with life at home and working from home and COVID. And I feel like we've gotten access to people who generally would be like too busy or you can only meet them like in Cannes or at CES or something and they're willing to just hop on and do a podcast. So that's been kind of cool. It hasn't affected me as much as I thought it would. You know, I would, I would think, well, you know, no more morning coffee meetings and things like that, but that, that just hasn't really um, affected me. One thing that I think uh, not to, not to, sideline everybody, but when I could be wrong on this, but one thing that I think might come up is that we, we see these um, current issues kind of um, coming together as uh, remote work and the economic crisis and the move toward diversity kind of come together because uh, there's been you know, all these jobs lost and one question that people have rightly asked that hasn't really been properly answered is, you know, what proportionally uh, have those job losses uh, more, um, have they affected more people of color? And then you have all these agencies and all these holding companies saying, okay, well, we're going to hire more people of color now moving forward. Okay, well, you know, where, when are those jobs going to yep. come? You know, and how are they going to tell us that they're going to, hire these people and then there's the there's a possibility that now that uh there is more remote work that there are more, more flexible that maybe there could be an allowance for, for for a little bit more of of that you know that that um they could hire people in different regions um, yeah maybe people could be um just to, to be frank that people could be hired at lower salaries um, I mean, I'll, I'll just say having built a remote workforce, it did, it, part of this might be we have a semi-blind hiring process, so it's more skills driven than, um, you know, kind of interview driven, but it has not taken extra effort to build a workforce that is highly representative of the U.S. population, which I, I know our agency partners uh, have trouble with um, when they're doing it 
strictly in Manhattan, you know. Um, and luckily Manhattan is, uh, New York City is a super diverse place, you know, um, in general. But, uh, you know, they, they tell us they, they, it's something they worry about and they're concerned about. And, um, and, and not just uh, racial diversity, they're concerned about age diversity and, and all that kind of stuff, too. It's certainly something you could do, at least at the entry level. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's hard to commit to, um, you know, oh, I'm going to hire a person, you know, of a different culture for this specific position. But if you only have white people applying, you're definitely going to hire a white person for that job. So you've got to get you know, a diverse mix into uh, the the mix for those. Into the hiring pipeline. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it, I think it at least has to start with that. Um, and then, you know, I think that there's there's opportunities. I mean, you know, there there are people in the industry, but it it is it, part of our problem is it's a relatively small pool at the senior levels and even the mid-level. Yep. Um, I'm still saying our, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> well, problems though, you know? Not, not industry anymore. So, and a lot of so the, we're getting, oh, sorry, go ahead, Patrick. I mean, that's just, I was just going to say that is one of the problems that a lot of people are brought in at the junior level and then they, they go to other industries or they, you know, agencies don't retain them. And so that's um, why there's not a lot of, or there, there are just very few people of color at senior levels. And it, I mean, it's one of yeah. many. I think that's part of it. Uh, you know, when somebody is the first person in their family to go to college, uh, their family is not pushing them to take a position that pays 35,000 a year in the first year. They're, you know, they, they want them to get out there and really start making some money. And in the agency industry at the entry level, you kind of wash it on your face for the first it's a problem. I think it's it's one of the fundamental structural issues, you know, that the the model, you know, has and it has to confront. And it's something that, you know, obviously we're really interested in, you know, it's over here. Same, it's the same in media and in, in journalism, you know, like it, getting paid a good salary out of the gate. So Right. It's it's a thing of privilege to be able to actually hold that job because it underpays. This is kind of what Look you're at saying. This panel. <laughs> Absolutely. I know. Right. Um, uh, well, it, right. at least it's not a mantle. So we, we you know, we're, we, we have, we fulfilled our no mantle promise uh, here, but we are working on the, uh, a much more diverse panel uh, coming up. Um, so we're getting towards the top of the hour. Uh, any last questions from the audience? Squeeze them into the chat or Q&A, but I think this would be a good time to do a kind of quick closing um, statement from, uh, from each of you guys. What is, you know, one thing that each of you would like to have our audience take away about, you know, being an ad tech journalist or, or working with you uh, or the challenges that you face? Uh, Laura, can we start with you? Sure. Um, yeah, just we want to speak to more people in the industry, as Patrick was saying earlier. Um, those people don't always have to be the CEO. And we also, you know, as much as agencies, ad tech companies are trying to diversify their ranks we're also trying to diversify the sources we speak to the people that we quote in stories um, and this frankly the stories that we write about underrepresented communities so like the one my one takeaway would just be like maybe have a rethink about who your company spokespeople are and don't always go to the go to and you know offer that those people as um as the only ones that we can speak to you've you've got a you know, a big workforce for a reason. So let's, let's hear from them all. Patrick. Yeah. I mean, I would say just because your client wants you to push something to me or to one of us, that doesn't mean that it's going to work. So push back because it's going to be a waste of everyone's time. There's only so many hours in the day. <laughs> okay. Allison, how about you? Um, I would, I would echo both of those things. Um, you know, make more people available more diverse people, more mid-level people, younger people, not younger, more junior people. <laughs> um, and also just like understand, take the time to learn and understand where we're coming from. You know, we don't work for you. We don't work for your client. We're trying to tell good stories for our audience. So just keep that in mind when you're pitching us and, and don't get, you know, upset if it's something that's not going to work because of that. First seek to understand and then to be understood, right? 
<laughs> well, so I'd like to extend a thank you to all of you guys and to Sarah for moderating. This has been uh, outstanding to have you guys up here. I've wanted to do this for a while, so I'm, I'm really glad uh, we've been able to make it happen. Um, this, for anyone who missed parts of this, we will get the video feed up live on our website, workreduce.com. Um, and uh, as uh, the host, let me thank uh, all our guests and our audience uh, again, and uh, see you all on one of our upcoming Work Reduce live panels. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again. Thanks to all of you. Thanks. Thanks.